welcome to Celebration Church. We just want to invite you to join us uh, as we lift the name of the Lord Jesus Christ high and we begin to sing. So we invite you to stand with us as we uh, sing about his amazing grace. the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is a Come. 
Jesus.
thank you and we praise you for your holiness. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We can never thank you enough. You created the world. You created us. And God, we ask that we will never, ever lose the wonder of your mercy and your grace and your love. Normally when we do a new one, we like to put it between a couple that we know. But this song, I believe, just sets up so well for the message that Rob's going to bring us about grace today. Because this song just delivers the gospel. And I believe it's really easy to catch on to. So we're going to put the words up there. And I'm just going to show you the course real quick. So I'm going to have the guys on the back go to the course. I'm throwing them a little curveball. It says, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore, for endless. We will sing your praise, oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Got that. Let's do that again. Praise the name.
blazing sun shall pierce the and I will run. Let's do that again. He shall return. He shall return in the robes of the blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will ride among the saints. My gaze transformed. go back to that third verse because the crucifixion wasn't the end it was the beginning and our Savior does not lay and lie inside of a tomb anymore he rose again now we have hope it's the hope of glory it's Christ in us the hope of glory and because of that death was defeated and we no longer have anything to fear So it's on the third. And on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven arose again. Oh, triple death.
Stay standing just for a second. I'm going to pray for us. Welcome. If you're a guest with us today, my name is Rob. I'm the lead pastor here. And man, what better song to sing than leading into our message today? That he's coming back, right? That we have a hope, we have a future in him. So let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. And I pray that we make it all about Jesus today from beginning to end and everything in the middle. I pray for every church in this region that Jesus would be glorified, that Jesus would be lifted up, God, and that you, God, would glorify him and that we would glorify you. Holy Spirit, would you continue to blow and breathe in this place and baptize us in the love of God. Will you say amen with me today? Amen. As you're being seated, look to the right, the left, behind you, in front of you. Shake someone's hand. Tell them that you're glad they're here today. Amen. Tell them real quickly you're glad they're here today. Amen. Amen. They're going to turn the light on here in the middle for us. Let there be light, and there was light. Amen. Awesome. 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 Well, we're glad all of you guys are here today. If you're a guest, you see a mass exodus of kids going out the back door. This is our time where we worship together as a whole faith family, and then our younger kids from ages 6 to 10, they go to Kids Celebrate. So if you would like your child to go to that, all you have to do is simply get with Miss Corey and her team, and they will get you um, checked in. We would love to have them back there with us. Um, let me just do a couple of announcements and a couple of little housekeeping things. BJ is going to keep the spiritual music going for me, so that way we can sound real spiritual. We want the announcements to sound really spiritual, too, for some reason. But um, anyhow... Um, just a couple of things. You should have received a worship guide just like this. If you didn't, I'm going to ask our regular attenders here to, if you don't mind giving yours up for one of our guests, if you see a guest that doesn't have one. I'm just going to go through it really quickly. Inside this worship guide, it's just going to tell you what to expect today. It tells you a little bit about our nursery and our kids celebrate. Uh, a big thing, if you're a first-time visitor with us today, is I'd love for you to fill out one of these cards. Okay? We're not going to call and telemarket you or harass you or anything like that. We're just simply going to send you a letter in the mail saying thank you for being with us today and how you can connect with us further. And then the, the, the third thing here is about Next. We have Next 401. We love to do the Next journey with as many people as possible because not only it allows you to find out about our church and what we're about and what's, what makes our, what is our heart be, but also it allows us to help you discover your redemptive purpose so you can start living on purpose so 401 is tonight if you say hey rob you know i've been thinking about serving i've been thinking about plugging in somewhere then you definitely want to come tonight because we're going to show you those areas where you can do that okay and the way to register for that is simply on our website or our facebook fan page uh two more things real quickly number one is our fall festival if you have signed up for the fall festival please get with miss Corey today before the end of service, she will tell you. She has a big sign-up sheet she has put together. But don't forget to bring your three to five bags of candy for your station. The church will have some candy as well. But please be on time. Please be ready to go. Uh, we expect probably about 200 people to be here again. So we would just love to be ready and on time. If you have some mean chili that you're going to be involved in the chili cook-off, you're probably going to lose because mine's the best. But you can still come and show up anyways. Okay? Because I'm a beast when it comes to cooking chili. But uh, by the grace of God, you may enter third or something like that, okay? But uh, it starts at 6.30 on Wednesday night. But here's, here's a big announcement. I've really just been chomping at the bit to share this with you guys before we dive into our teaching time today. And I think I put it on the slide is that uh, our building fund is now at $18,700. Yeah, give Jesus a hand, okay? So I, for our guest, I want to say this real quickly and for those that have been coming because I want to encourage you when we started this journey we've always prayed that God would do these things in such a way that he would get the credit for it and listen I love all of you and I pray that all of you make yourselves available and all of you understand what it means to give generously sacrificially but you know this at your church we never preach about money here very rarely you want to know why because I've always wanted to trust in the sovereignty of God over the, the, your generosity okay I love you I'm not saying it to be a jerk I'm just being real, okay? And do you know that in two, three, two and a half months that God has used two anonymous donors to give over $11,000? 
because they see the vision and the mission and the heart of what God is doing. So I, I want to show you this today to challenge all of you, to challenge me, that when I read John 3, 16, am I giving willingly, intently, generously, and sacrificially so more lost people can be one? I promise you God's going to do it. And I love it when he does it like this because we can't take even this much credit for it. And it's not about building the kingdom of Celebration Church. It's about advancing the kingdom of God. Amen? We want to reach those 20,000 people in this area. So I'm going to pray for our teaching time here, and then we're going to dive right into grace. Father, we love you today. Would you just illuminate the gospel to our spirits, to our hearts today? God, I thank you that you are so generous. Would you just pour out your grace? Father, I pray for a tidal wave of your grace in this place today. Gee, Holy Spirit, I pray that hearts would be awakened to Jesus. And if they don't know you today, that they would not leave here without being in relationship with you. So we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. BJ, can we sing that chorus one more time? Just right where you're sitting. Come on, church, if you know it. This is what we're going to be doing forever anyways. dive in today. We are in part two of a series that we started last week entitled Grace is Greater. But what I said last week was I said, I believe that grace experienced is greater than grace explained. However, before we can experience grace, we have to know what grace is. Right? Does that make sense? And so I tell people this that want to be radical worshipers. I hear this all the time in the circles that I've run in for years. I want to be this radical worshiper. I want to be this deep worshiper. The first thing I ask him is, how deep is your knowledge of the gospel? Because the, nosh, the gospel, not the noshbol, the gospel will fuel a radicalness like never before. Okay? You understand? So you want to be a deep worshiper. If you want to really understand grace, before we can experience it, we've got to understand it, right, so we can experience it. But here's the other key, so we can appropriate it in our lives as well. Okay? Because I feel like there's so many Christians today that don't really have a, a, a good grasp of what grace is. And so if we're called to go out and make disciples, then we're di discipling people in a half-hearted truth, right? Does that make sense? Or, or, or just some of the truth. And the reality is if you don't grasp grace, you're not going to grasp the gospel. Because from, from, from beginning to the end, it's a book of grace, okay? So last week I attempted to take just a few minutes. You guys know this. We only get about 35, 40 minutes. Some of you like five minutes already like this, but most of you, 20, 25 minutes. I'm not hating. I just see it, okay? But uh, 30, 35 minutes with you, and some of these subjects are hard to get to everything, but we never want this to be your main source, source of nourishment, okay? You should be studying the gospel on your own. And so last week we began to define grace, right? We talked about grace being undeserving. Uh, we can't merit it. It's a gift from God. We talked about grace is free, which everybody loves to hear, but we forget the second part, that it's not cheap, right? That grace was epitomized in a person on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago, right? But I love this one. Grace has a purpose, right? And can I just be very clear with you? In American culture, even in the church culture, where everything has become man-centric, that's not what grace is for. Grace is Christ-centric, right? That grace has a purpose, that grace has come to you and me, John 3, 16, in order that we display the richness and the kindness of his mercy and his grace, right? Let me just put this to you this way. If you are the object of your faith this morning, you're going to be a very miserable person. Okay? It's all about Jesus. It's all about what he's done. And so last week we, 
we try to attempt to define that, I'm going to ask him to put the J.I. Packer quote on there. It's one of my favorite quotes, and, and I'm not going to rehash everything. I encourage you to go back on YouTube or our Facebook fan page or our website, and you can watch the replays of this. I heard the preacher is really good that preached it last week, so you, I definitely want to check it out. Okay, in the New Testament, grace means God's love in action. Thank you for the three people that laughed with me on that one. Uh, God's love in action, right? God just doesn't say he loves you. He demonstrates that he's loving you. That's Romans 5 eight. okay? Love in action towards men who merited the opposite of love. Well, who is that? That's all of us. We want to be politically correct this morning, men and women, right? All of us merited the opposite of love. Well, Rob, I'm a good person. Survey says, eh. Okay, I need one of those, by the way. Like, right? That'd be awesome to have. I don't know if we could put that in the budget when we move, but right? That'd be so awesome. The opposite of love, grace means God, I love this, moving heaven and earth to save sinners who could not lift a finger to save themselves. Okay? I need you to understand this this morning. Because God in his initiating love moved toward us, not the opposite. You understand that? If somebody needs to say amen on that because that's the truth, right? God in his initiating love moved towards us who were wicked and depraved, these insidious hearts, loved and craved everything else above him. And his love, he moved towards us. And he sent Jesus to die. For us. So last week, we, we began to define what is grace, right? We took just a few minutes to do that. Today, we're going to talk about why, why do we need grace, right? And, and just the news flash, just so we can be on the same page, you need grace, right? No, I don't, Rob. Uh, yes, you do, okay? We all need grace. Let me prove it to you. Even if you think God is not real, even if you're agnostic today or atheist, or maybe you adhere to some other... Uh, Eastern religion or whatever, right? The reality is the car that you drove today, the food that you ate, right? The, the fruity pebbles that you smashed on before you came to church, the ramen noodles that you ate last night, right? The drinks and everything else that you participated in, the house, uh, you, you woke up out of bed today, is all what we call God's common grace. It's by his grace that he's allowed us to be here today. Okay? Right? You understand? So today, we need grace, but today I want to look at it through uh, salvation, through the lens of salvation. But here's the thing. I need to give you some bad news in the beginning so we can appreciate the good news at the end. You with me? So hopefully you had a good cup of coffees. I put some little chocolate donuts out there. They should have made you feel really good. I almost thought about bringing some Connie's in here to get it really going. But uh, So stick with me through the bad news for a minute, okay? But we got to do the bad news before we can get the good news. How many people know we'll appreciate the good news more, won't we? We'll appreciate the good news more if we understand the bad news. So let's look in Genesis 3, 2 through 7. And I've used several versions of the Bible today. If you've been around us any time at all, we don't fuss about what version you need to use. I personally think God's preferred version is the ESV, but I like the NSAB too. Some people like the NIV, the you know TTI, whatever. I'm just making stuff up now because there's so many of them, right? The Passion Translation. Here, here's the bottom line. I always recommend that people read different versions of the Bible, but if you don't know what the different versions about, generally the NASB and the ESV are the most word-for-word -word translations that we have. So if you want a word-for-word -word translation, stick with the ESV. Some of them are more paraphrasing. Some of them just kind of capture the thought of the whole uh, scripture. But if you didn't know that, that was free for you this morning, so you can kind of pick which version. I personally use the ESV, but we use a lot of the NIV here on Sunday mornings just because it's easier for some people to follow. So let's look at it real quickly, okay? Genesis 3. Now, here we are in the garden. If you didn't grow up around church, even if you did grow up around church, you've probably heard of this guy named Adam and Eve, right? This guy and this gal named Adam and Eve, right? We pretty much are there. We don't have to rehash that. God creates man. He sees that it's not good for man to be alone. He creates the woe man, right? And, he put, and, and, and they have this perfect, harmonious relationship. That's why I love Lorena, man, because Lorena is always with me. Thank you, Lorena, for being with me. Thank you. She's with me. It's just her and I on an island by ourselves, but we're together. We're, we're going forward. You know, we're like Braveheart on that island, okay? So the man and woman together in this harmonious, perfect, harmonious relationship between them and God and themselves, and God gives them one rule. Now, listen, I don't mean this mean this morning, but this shows you how dumb really humans can be and how wicked we really are. He gives them 
One, can, one rule, right? Now, have you ever told your kids, you can do anything when I leave except don't touch this? And guess what they do when you leave, right? And then you just want to ninja kick them for a few minutes and all of that. I mean, not literally. Don't take it if you're a guest with today. We're not a violent church here or anything like that. We're just saying, you know, figuratively, okay? But this is what happened here. God puts them in the Garden of Eden. This perfect says, anything you can do except for eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Now, here's the other thing that I want to point out, and I don't. this has really nothing to do with the message today per se, but it doesn't say that they ate an apple. Okay? Some of you are like, really? Yeah, go read the Bible. It doesn't say that they have an apple. I know that's what we've seen our whole life, but I, I want to be very careful that we don't add something to the Word of God. That's not what it said. Okay? So I'm going to challenge you to go look at that. So you're going to learn a lot more today than you really think, okay? So here's Genesis 3, 2 through 7. Now the serpent, right? This was Satan in the form of a serpent here, was more crafty than any other beast of the field that God, the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? Uh, yes, he did say that, right? But he's crafty, and look what he says. Did God really say that? Now, side point here. Have you ever had the enemy tell you that in your own life? Right? And then you listen, but it was by his grace that he provided a way of redemption. We're going to see that here too, okay? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of all the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So God said, Don't even touch it. Right? Don't even touch it, right, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Well, here's the kicker. They were already created in the image of God, but they were not created to be gods. You understand? That's our biggest sin, I believe, as human beings, is that we love being our own sovereign and our own king. We love our version of the truth, don't we? Okay? And he says this, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, right? That's like when you see those Oreo double stuffed cookies laying on the counter right before you go to bed, and you're thinking, this doesn't need it. But it like it's like a tractor beam that sucks you over there. And then you get a big class of milk, and you dip those jokers in there, and one turns into two, then two turns into six. I'm thinking this may have been something like this. The light to the eyeballs here, okay? Okay, for those that like double stuff, if you don't, then think of whatever, an apple or something, whatever your thing is, okay? And the tree, I just like double stuff. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, and she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave it to her husband, who was a dummy, who was with her, and he ate. I added that. That's the Rob James version right there, okay? And he ate, right? Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin cloths. I just love saying that word, loin cloths, okay? Here was this perfect relationship that now is marred by sin. I'm bringing that up to you because Paul revisits this in Romans 5, which is right below this. We're going to talk about it. If you don't think you need grace today, I need you to understand something. We were all born into sin. Okay? We are all born into sin. No one was born good. Right? No one was born righteous. I don't care if your dad was a deacon for 30 years and an elder and all this other stuff. We were born sinful and into sin. I'm going to prove it to you. Romans 5.12 says this. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man... Right? He's speaking of Adam. This is Paul writing. And death through sin, in this way, death came to all people because of what? I even highlighted it for you. All have sinned. Now, let me ask you something. What does all mean? Right. Somebody goes, all. I mean, I know that. Right? Really? <laughs> right? Everyone. Right? We've all sinned. Okay? Sin entered the world. When we go back to Gen Genesis chapter 3, and Paul writes in Romans 3, that sin has done. Romans 3.10, let me read this to you real quickly. As it is written, there is no one righteous. What does no one mean? Could you say no one kind of means like all, right? 
I just want to make sure. I, I wasn't the smartest guy out there. I just wanted to make sure, okay? Not even one. So Paul even says, just in case you don't know what no one means, I'm just going to be redundant here and go, not even one, okay? There, there is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Can we go to the next part? I, want, I, want, oh, I mean, go back just real quick. I want to go back to right here, okay? To the middle one. I'm sorry for confusing you. I need you to underline that. I, I put no one, but underline the word seek. You did not seek God because you were dead in your sinfulness, because you loved and preferred everything else. You sought other lovers, other gods, but God in his initiating love, and you can put in parentheses next to that little note right there in your sheet, put Romans 5, 8 and go see what he did for you, that he demonstrated his love for you. When you didn't seek him, all have turned. So Paul says it again, all, just in case we didn't understand what no one and not even one meant. Now he says all have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. No one who does good. In other words, your most righteous acts on your best day will never, ever merit or warrant the grace of God. Okay? Never. Okay? Not even one. Paul even says it again. Just in case we didn't understand the first not even one, he puts another not even one in there for us. And he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Can we go to Isaiah 64, 6 real quickly? I, don't, I have it in parentheses in your notes, but I'm going to put it on the screen. Here we go again. And really what Paul is rehashing is this right here. Okay? All of us have become like one who is unclean. Right? All... Our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Let me stop here. I don't want to get gross here. But really, the language of, in, the, in the Old Testament, this really means, and, and there again, we're, we're, we're going to go a little PG-13. This word right here really means uh, like menstruating rags. Okay? I'm not trying to gross you out. I'm just being real. I like to say it this way. I did a sermon one time for some youth, and I called it porta potty righteousness. Has anybody ever seen a porta potty Raise your hand. Right? My wife absolutely hates them. My wife will hold it all day and not use the porta potty. Okay, she hates them. They disgust her because there's flies and they smell weird. And it's always like on a hot day, right? Whatever. Okay, but if you ever look in a porta potty, there's a lot of stuff in there. I don't want to gross you out because you haven't eaten lunch yet today. Okay, right? But nobody goes. Nobody look. And I don't know what it is. Maybe I just keep my mind checked. But I always look in there for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, I don't want to. But it's like this thing that pulls me into this. Maybe it's a, maybe I need the 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 the, uh, the the brain mapping thing on me that that Matt has. Maybe I need that fix those waves or whatever in my mind. Okay, right now listen. Some of you're laughing, but you do the same sick thing too. I know how you guys operate, right? Right. That's how you do. And it's like it just sucks you in. You're like, I don't want to look, right? But I, but it's nasty. It's gross, right? There is. Just stuff in there. Let me just put it that way, right? Some stuff, it even talks to you sometimes, you know, right? But here's the thing. That's our righteousness on our best day in the eyes of God. Porter potty righteousness, okay? Seriously. That's what it looks gross on our best day. 20 years from now, even if you've been the best Christian and you've checked off every box, your righteous acts will never be good enough to merit anything. It's only because of the perfect work of the cross. Okay? So I, I want to get this point across to you because I need you to see this, right? Can, can I just be honest with you? We need to own our sin today. We need to own it. I think sometimes we don't own it, and when we don't own it, then we can't really get help for it because then we try to be something that we're really not. Right? You, make sense? Let me show you something real quick. Because I put on there, what is sin? And uh, Matt was so kind to let me borrow this, this dartboard here. Now, I need to pick someone I really don't like to hold it. Uh, let's see here. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just teasing. Um, yeah, Carlos, come on up here. I like you, Carlos, but I'm just teasing. We're not going to throw it at Carlos, okay? We're not going to do it for real, okay? If you just hold it, this is like America's Got Talent. Just pretend that we're on there, and um, okay? But if you look on there, what is sin, Right? Did we put the definition in the screen? I can't remember if we put it in there or not. If it's on your notes, I know that for sure. Here's what sin really means in the language of the New Testament. It means to miss the mark, right? 
In other words, this is God's righteousness in the bullseye. Jesus hits a bullseye every time because Jesus is perfect. Jesus' righteousness is perfect. Okay? Our righteousness never hits the bullseye unless we are in Christ. You understand? So what sin really means is to miss the mark, to miss the target. Don't get scared, Carlos. Okay? Right? You see what I'm saying? So every time on our best day, this is our righteousness. It never hits the mark. We fall short of the glory of God every day. And the only hope that we have is to be in Christ. Thank you, Carlos. I'm, you didn't look that scared, and I'm very appreciative of that. Thank you so much. Okay? I know that's a very basic thing to put together, but I think sometimes we don't understand really what it means. If you look here on your notes, it says it also means to transgress. It means to act perversely. It means to fall away from the truth. It means lawlessness and irreverence. Okay? That, that's what it means. It means that we were born. Let me, let me prove it to you. How many of you had to teach your child to lie? To take things from other children? Now, I know you think your children are angels, but they're not sometimes. So let's just be real about it. Okay, let's own it today. Okay? Newsflash. Right? How many teach them how to want things that don't belong to them? How did, did you teach them to not make their bed and clean their rooms? Where do you think that comes from? From our sinful nature. Right? Does that make sense? You didn't have to teach it to them. We were born into sin. Right? We didn't have to teach them to be selfish or to be mean to others. Right? Just reference the passages above that we just read and you will see that. So here's the thing. Sin is both a hater and a lover. Okay? Here's what I mean by that. It's a hater of God's truth and it's a lover of our own. Right? Our own version of the truth says this, that we are good, that we are righteous, and we live in a society today that tells us that it's all about us and do whatever feels good. Follow your heart. And let it cuddle you. Right? And the reality is that's opposite of the gospel. Can I just be very blunt with you? If you're in a relationship with someone or you're following someone who's following their heart, get out of it. Just telling you, about as blunt as I can be. It's not about following your heart, ladies and gentlemen. See, I told you this was going to be the bad news. It's about following Jesus. It's about following the Spirit of God. Because your heart is deceitful. I'm going to prove it to you, okay? I'm going to prove it to you. And if you've been around this, you already know, okay? Let me show you something. Can we put that John Piper graphic up just real quickly? And it's maybe hard for you to read it. I'm sorry, but I tried... I did, to be honest with you, I was lazy. I didn't want to retype this whole thing, okay? I'm owning it today, right? All right? One of my favorite pastors put it this way. What is sin? It is the glory of God not honored, the holiness of God not reverenced, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored, the faithfulness of God not trusted, the commandments of God not obeyed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, the person of God not loved. That is sin. I don't really need to say anything else above that. He does it so beautifully. Sin is loving everything else and cherishing and treasuring everything else above God is the bottom line. Does that make sense? Okay. Do you see now why we need grace? Right? Romans 1, 18 through 19 says it this way. The wrath of God is being revealed. Now, this isn't popular. You're not supposed to grow churches by sharing these verses because nobody like people want verses that cuddle you a little bit. This one offends you, doesn't it? The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness, right, and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, here's the thing. Go back for a minute, guys, real quickly. Here's the thing that we're guilty of is the next part of it says this, that we can walk out here today. You can wake up today when you leave your house and you've got to admit, even if you don't believe in God, that there's some intelligent designer that made the heavens and the skies and the trees and whatever. Right? Could we all agree with that for a second? 
right? There was something greater than you that made this. This passage, Paul is writing that what we're guilty of, our sinfulness includes taking the truth that God has so plainly given us and suppressing it and loving our own version of the truth more. Look what it says. Let's go to the second part, please, guys. Okay? Since that we may be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them. In other words, it doesn't matter if you're on some remote island somewhere. It doesn't matter if you live right over here on South Gloucester Street. The reality is you can walk outside today and see that there is something greater than you and I. Okay? So what is sin? It's loving. It, it, it's, it's, any, it's any feeling or any thought or any speech or any action that comes from a heart that does not treasure God over all things. I like to, one of my favorite pastors puts it this way, that sin has infected and affected everything. Okay? So that's the bad news. Right? Some of you are like, geez. That's the bad news. But I want to share with you one more thing here, just real quickly, and then we're going to get to some good news. I want to be very, very clear. Okay? I want to make sure that we understand this, that we are all born this way. Okay? doesn't matter what lineage you come from. doesn't matter what heritage you come from. doesn't matter where and how or whose family line you come from. We are all born this way. And apart from the supernatural work of the cross, we remain that way. Okay? So, here's the good news. Okay, and this, um, this is grace explained. Here's the good news, okay? Is now we're going to talk about why it's necessary that we need grace, okay? And it's going to take a lot of burden off of you and a lot of pressure off of you. I believe some of you believers today, you've been trying to earn your salvation. See, we at Celebration Church don't believe in working for your salvation. We believe in working from your salvation. Okay? And some of you, your whole life, you've been trying to earn it, and you've realized after about 20 years you can't earn it, and it's very frustrating, and it's this perpetual cycle of frustration because you will never live up to the standard that Jesus already lived up to. Does that make sense? All right, so let's look at number one. Number one is I can't save myself. You have it on your notes there. If you have some notes in front of you, if you don't, some of our faith family, if you see a guest that doesn't have a copy, if you don't mind giving yours up, that'd be awesome. Right? I can't save myself. Okay. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of work so that anyone can boast. It's by grace, through our faith in the cross, that we are saved. It is a gift of God that he has given us. There's nothing that we did. There's nothing we can do to merit it. And here's why. Because if you yourself can save yourself, then I've said this before, the same self that will tell you how wonderful you are one minute is the same self that will tear you down the next. Has anybody ever been a victim to yourself before? Right? But if God saves you, then he does it right the first time. And now you have confidence in his perfect work, not something that you've done. And so now I boast in his perfect work and know that it's nothing that I could ever do in my own self. Okay? Galatians 2.21, this is the Amplified Version. I'm sorry for all the brackets. The Amplified Version puts the brackets in there, but I love the way they state this. It's, this is Paul writing to the book of the churches in Galatia, and he says this. He says, I do not ignore or nullify, right, the gracious gift of the grace of God. In other words, his amazing and unmerited favor. For if righteousness comes through observing the law, then Christ died needlessly. In other words, his suffering and his death would have had no purpose whatsoever. Okay. Here's, here's what I want you to see. As Paul is writing in this original context, he's dealing with this group of people called the Judaizers. And the reality is today, we don't call them the Judaizers, but we have, in Ju we have Judaizers in the whole body of Christ that are out there. And here's the Judaizers. I'm going to give you the simple version because I, you know, I want to give you the real simple version so we can all understand. The Judaizers, here's the basic version. 
is they said, yes, we believe in Jesus. But they wanted to add to the work that had already been done. Right? In this case, they wanted uh, the Gentiles to be circumcised. They wanted them to, to practice other uh, ceremonial laws and things that they had observed as, as the Jew. Right? There was nothing wrong with observing it. Right? But the reality is baptism, communion, coming to church on Sunday, doing mission trips, they don't save you. It's only the perfect work of Jesus that saves you. So let me put it to you very basically. The Judaizers believe Jesus plus something else works. And that's not the case. When Jesus said it was finished, he meant it. It's finished. You with me? You can't save yourself. Just in case I'm not clear, let me be clear. Salvation is based on the perfect righteousness of Christ, not my good works. He accomplished our salvation. Just in case I'm still not clear, let me give it to you from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. They're going to put it on the screen. He says this, nothing you and I can do can ever put us right with God. Your best works are useless as your worst works. That's offensive a little bit. But you need to understand that everything is the righteousness of God. Let me put it to you another way. Your salvation is not based on your resume, but rather Christ's perfect righteousness. You understand that? We live in a culture where we want to we want to accumulate this awesome resume, right? When you go to get a job, you want that resume blinged out, don't you? Because you want them to hire you. In this case, you can never perform enough to meet the standard that Jesus has already met. Because when we do, when we add any type of merit to the gospel, we contaminate it. Even if it's just one little ounce of merit, we contaminate the gospel. We pervert the gospel. Listen, obedience is necessary. I'm not saying we don't need to be obedient. Here's the difference, right? I said it a few minutes ago. We do not work for our salvation. We work from our salvation. Does that make sense? Your acceptance, your justification, and your adoption by God is not based on your performance for him, but listen, but rather Jesus' performance for us. You understand that? Your salvation, the totality of your salvation is based on his performance for you, not on your performance for God. And that is a hard truth for us to grasp, friends, because we live in a society that tells us to perform, 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 earn, work. The gospel is countercultural and totally different. Okay? Now listen, somebody should be like dancing and shouting and praising God on that one. This is good news that he has already accomplished the perfect work, that I can't save myself instead of me trying to do a whole bunch of stuff to save myself. Why don't we do this? Why don't we rest in what he's already done? See the difference? Some of you are so worn out being a Christian. Some of you have rejected Christianity because you saw the wrong view of it. Some of you are frustrated today because you're trying to earn and you're trying to live this double life when the reality is it has nothing to do with you about trying to earn something as much as it is just being what he's already called you to be. And the best way to do that is to rest in what he's already done. See? It's totally counter-cultural, right? So just to be really clear one more time before we move on, being really redundant here, it's this simple. Trust in Christ. Trust in Christ. When you add something else to that, we contaminate the gospel. Number two, here's a big one that I think our society needs to understand. I can't fix myself. Grace Explained says I can't save myself. I can't fix myself. I don't want you to raise your hand today, but I want you to be honest right in your seat, just in your mind, in your heart. Have you ever thought there was something wrong with you? The reality is there's something wrong with all of us. It's our sinful nature. Okay? But more than that, have you ever just tried to fix yourself? Have you ever just tried to modify your behavior? Have you ever just tried to do certain things? Especially if, if we're Christians, we, we tend to do this sometimes and, 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 and we modify our behavior, right? To make us look more like God instead of allowing God to, to work on us. Now, l- before I get into this, let me just pause. Let me take a time out here. And listen, I need you to come close on this real quickly. I don't want to be that church that doesn't understand that mental illness is for real. 
Okay, you with me? I need you all to look at me. And be serious here for a minute. There are people that have real mental issues. And I get so sick and tired of the church. So just come up on the prayer line and get prayer and do all this kind of... I'm not against all that. And they do it just like that, by the way, too. What I'm saying to you is God has made doctors and given us doctors and physicians to help people that really need help. Now, the best thing we can do is go back to point one and say you need to be born again. But the second thing is... We need to understand. We, we don't need to be, what's the old saying? We don't need to be so spiritually minded that we're no earthly good. And that we don't understand. Let me give you an example. My brother today is up at the VA clinic in Memphis. And he's dealing with PTSD, which that and along with the death of my sister led him into a, a very, uh, just this perpetual cycle of drug abuse. Right? And the way that we grew up in church was you just kind of got slapped with the spirit and got a little bit of prayer and everything was going to be honky-dory. And the reality is things weren't getting honky-dory. But by the grace of God, he allowed the VA clinic to be in Memphis. And now my brother is going on almost five, five and a half months sober. And he's doing well. So I, I, want, I want to pause for a minute. I don't want this to be like that kind of teaching. Right? But here's the reality. It all starts first with the saving work of Christ. Okay? And I'm going to show you why in just a second. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? I, I, I want it to be serious for a minute. I don't... I don't want to be that church that we don't understand that people have real mental issues, that people have real addictions, that people have all this. And I'm not saying God can't deliver you from them because I've seen him do it, but I'm not so ignorant spiritually that God doesn't use other sources to accomplish his work. Here's the bottom line. Everything belongs to the Lord, and he'll use whatever the heck he wants to use to accomplish his will. Let's just put it that way, okay? Okay? I can't fix myself, right? Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.17 real quickly. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, friends, if you are not in Christ today, don't wait to the very end of the service. Right where you're at, you cry out to God and you say, I repent of my sins. I trust in you. I want you to be the Lord of my life, being in Christ. That's what it means. He is what a new creation. I can't fix myself, but he can. Right? He not only saves me, but he makes me a new creation the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Right? I cannot fix myself. Romans 5, 6, I think we have it in the screen there. I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. Here's why you can't fix yourself. Because the problem is not about managing your external behavior. Everything that defiles you, and we'll see it in just a second, comes from within. You see? See, behavior modification works this way, friends. Behavior modification works from the outside in. Jesus works from the inside out. Let me say that again. Religious performance, behavior modification. Yes. Right? That's why when you come to church sometimes and somebody asks you how you're doing. I mean, I don't think anybody in here, because you guys look really spiritual today, but other, other people. Right? When they ask you, well, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing good, brother. Right? You get like this game show voice, don't you? I'm doing wonderful, and God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. But yet, you and your wife just cussed each other out on the way to church. Right? Some of you are laughing because you did it. Right? All the time, God is good, and... Right? God is good all the time, brother. Right? Now, I don't think that happens here, though. Here's the reality. is It's because our culture has taught us to be. And the reality is Jesus just wants us to come as we are because he's not intimidated by your mess this morning. He's not scared of your questions. He wants to heal you and transform you and put those things together. Right? And I have found that God visits me the most when I'm just real with him. When I don't say sometimes, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. When I just say, hey, God, I really don't understand. This really stinks. You know, God still meets me because of his grace. See? Right? Look what, look what the Gospels write in Mark 7, 20, 23. It says, he went on. What comes out of a person... Right? 
doesn't defile him. Here again, Jesus is dealing with the religious Pharisees. There was these guys who were the Pharisees, right, that believed and observed. They observed all the laws and all the commandments, over 600 of them, right? But the reality is they still didn't get it, that it wasn't about managing external behavior, right? It wasn't about following rules that what defiles you comes out. And this is what he says. What comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within out of a person's heart. Remember I told you don't follow someone who's following their heart? Don't hate the messenger, right? Hate the person that put it in the Bible. But yet what does every song tell us to do today? Right? I mean, the great theologian Justin Bieber tells us to follow the heart. Right? Isn't it? Every song and everything that we listen to is crafted and designed And the reality is our hearts are fickle, right? And they're sinful, okay? So I, I, you were thinking, I wonder if he's, I, I, don't, I don't like that, man, that he's saying that. Well, you don't have to like me. It, it, I didn't say it, okay? Now, he goes on to say what comes out of the heart. So let's look at it real quickly. Well, out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come, right? I love it when people tell me that they're a good person, and I ask them, would you be willing to write all your thoughts on a piece of paper today and I share them at church? Then all of a sudden they're like, uh... Well, I guess I'm not that good. Right? Okay? Comes sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from the in, from inside and defile a person. That's that's a pretty long list. This is what comes now, let me be very clear. I'm a person that loves self-help. I love Tony Robbins and Brian Tracy and all that. I'm not saying for those that are with me on the self-help stuff that we should not listen to self-help and we shouldn't read books and, and all that. I believe in all of that. But at the core, the root of the problem is not yourself cannot fix. It's only the gospel is the remedy for this. You understand? Okay. So I want to make sure that we, under, we understand that. Right? Jeremiah 17, 9. Let me just show it to you again. That way nobody thinks I'm just making this stuff up. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Right? Can I just be very blunt? This is why you shouldn't follow preachers. Like, I'm just going to follow my heart. Uh, no, thank you. They should follow the Spirit of God. See the difference? Okay? And beyond cure, who can understand it? You and I cannot fix ourselves. Okay? Only the power that is found in the gospel. Let me put it to you way one of my favorite pastors puts it real quickly. It's Matt Chandler. He says it this way. Without a heart transformed by the grace of Christ, we just continue to manage external and internal darkness. Okay? Without the perfect work of Christ, the power of Christ. What's the power of Christ? The Holy Spirit who now lives in us. All we're doing is managing it. We're just moving it from one space of the heart to the other. You ever done that when you've cleaned your house? You just take the mess and you put it from one closet to the other or out in the garage or out back. You know what I'm talking about? Or when somebody comes over to your house, you've ever done this? You shove everything into one room in a closet and you're like kicking the door in and you're hoping that they don't go in there? That's what we do with our darkness without the power of Christ. Can I just be honest with you? Jesus wants to set some of you free today because you've been doing this for about 20 years. He's saying today, if you really want it to be gone, give it to me for real this time, and I will remedy and I'll fix it. I'm not guaranteeing that the gospel will teach you. Okay? You with me? Okay? So let me put it to you this way, and then we'll go on to point three and we'll close. A better version of myself is not the solution to your unsatisfaction. Some of you are unsatisfied today. And what you're doing is you're trying to make a better version of yourself. You think God will fall more in love with you if you better yourself. Can I just be honest with you? That's the enemy telling you. Okay? Let me give you an example. If I just get that six-pack, I'll feel better about myself. Okay? I've only had like a two-pack. I've never had a six-pack. Right? 
and it felt good for a minute, but it really was fleeting, wasn't it? Or if, if I could just, you know, lose the weight, or if I could just make more money and get a bigger house and a nicer car, if I could just get that one guy or girl to love me, I will be happy for the rest of my life. It's not about a better version of yourself. God is willing to meet you right where you're at today. But the good news is, by His grace, He will not leave you. Isn't that good? He's not intimidated, friends. He's not intimidated by our mech. See, when we attempt to try to fix ourselves in our own power, here's what we're basically telling God. I make a better God than you do. I can fix myself without your help. Friends, I tried that for a really long time, and I hurt a lot of people and made a lot of mess. Stop trying to fix yourself today. And just come and kneel at the cross. Give it to Jesus. Amen? Let me put it to you this way, and then we'll move to point three. Your sinful acts, listen, I think we, we don't understand this sometimes. Your sinful acts don't make you a sinner, but because you're a sinner, you do sinful acts. Now, let me pause, because I know we have a non-denominational church here, and people get their, maybe I'm working on this underwear in a wad. My wife doesn't want me to say panties anymore. She wants me to say underwear. So, get your underwear in a wad, right? For some. Some of you go, well, I'm not a sinner. I'm a saint. Well, listen. Whether you believe you're a, a saint, a safe sinner, a sinner that's now a saint, I'm confusing myself now, but it, you, here's the reality. Here's the reality. The only righteousness you have is because of Jesus. Okay? The rest of it is just a stinking labor. Okay? Now, if you ask me, what do I believe? I'm a sinner that needs grace. And the only reason I can have the label saint on it is because of what he did 2,000 years ago. For me. Okay? So you can argue with somebody else about that, but I just want to make sure that we understand that. Okay? You've got to be politically correct in these days, right? All right. Here's the thing. There's no worse idea that we as a church can do. Listen. Than promote. There's nothing worse that we as a church can do than to promote the idea that people need to fix themselves and get their act together before they can and earn our love and our friendship. Because if that's the case, then we would still be dead in our sins. We merited the opposite. You hear what I said? I never want us to be a church that promotes the idea that people have to fix themselves and get their act together before they can become a part of our faith. Never. And the day we do that, I'm out. Okay? Number three is I can't free myself. I can't save myself, right? This is the good news. I can't save myself. Jesus can save me. Jesus can fix me. And here's the thing. Jesus can free me. Here's what I mean by this. Because without him intervening, Paul writes, and we're going to see it here in the scripture in just a second, Paul writes that we're slaves to sin, that we're born into this sinful nature because of Adam's sin in the garden that we read about in Genesis 3. We are slaves to sin. And what happens is we're like the walking dead, right? Have you seen the show The Walking Dead, the zombies? That's how we are. We're like sin zombies. We're just walking dead, right? Dead in our sin, dead in our trespasses. But Jesus, because of God's grace in through Christ Jesus, right, through faith in Christ, we now have the power, right, to combat sin. And Paul writes it to this. Listen, I want to, I want to read it to you. Romans 6, 15 through 18. What then? Shall we sin? No, right? Paul's saying to these people that, listen, I'm preaching the grace of God, but it doesn't mean that the grace of God is a license to do whatever the heck we want to do. See, legalism, which we talked about earlier, and license both pervert the gospel. One says I need to add something. One says I got my fire insurance card and I can do whatever the heck I want to do. They're, they, they have perverted the gospel, both ideas, Okay. So this is what Paul is writing here to these people. No, no, no. You don't just don't do whatever you want to do because a heart that is truly transformed is a heart that its affections have changed. Right? And there should be fruit of this transformation. Shall we sin because we are under the law but, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey, whether you, submit, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, 
or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Okay? Here's the bottom line, short version. Every day we wake up and we have a choice to make whether we'll be a slave to our flesh or allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. Before, we were just dead in our sins. You see, we were just following. We were like zombies, just... Uh, uh, right? But when you're born again and you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit, your new creation, now is living inside of you. He gives you the power to every day to be more like Christ. It's what we call sanctification. That we grow and we mature to be more like Christ. Some of you want to be free from whatever it is you want to be free, but you're trying to do it in your own power, and you're trying to do it through religion and not a relationship with Jesus. And the reality is it's just this never-ending cycle. How do I know that? Because I've been there. And today, Jesus is saying, I will set you free. Right? But it's allowing him to be king and sovereign of everything. Romans 8, 2, and we'll close with this. And because you belong to him, see, I highlighted the word belong, because I need you to understand this is surrendering to Christ. The power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power that leads to sin and death. There's one passage of scripture in Galatians 5.16 that says that if we will follow after the spirit, well, they have it on the screen there, we will not gratify, or some versions say satisfy the desires of the flesh. You have no power within yourself to overcome this sin thing. Let me just, let me close with this. Here, here's the bottom line with grace, because I'm running out of time. Grace is simply saying this. I can't, but God can. Well, why didn't you say it in the very beginning, Rob? Because I want to take a little bit of your time. Today, it's okay to say, I can't. In Romans 5, there's a passage of Scripture where it says that Jesus came and died for the ungodly. Some versions say the weak just means the utterly helpless. See, in this culture, we think weakness is bad, but to the gospel, it's a beautiful thing that we come today and we say, I can't anymore. I can't save myself. I can't fix myself. I can't free myself, but I know of the one that can, and today I surrender to you. Friends, as we respond, and BJ is going to lead us in the song, please understand this today. Stop trying to live out of performance and learn how to live out of acceptance. In Christ, you're accepted, you're made right by God. So listen, I want to speak to two people as we close and we respond. If you want to experience the grace of God today for the first time, here's what it starts with. It starts with repenting. It starts with believing. It starts with surrendering. And it's not the prayer that saves you. I could put a nice little prayer on the screen and it will not save you. What saves you is the posture of your heart, the posture of your life saying, I can't, but you can. If that is you today, writing your seat, we're not going to send 20 people to tackle you. We're not going to call you up here. Writing your seat right now. You say, I just can't anymore. I need you. I'm desperate for you. I want to experience this grace that Rob is talking about today. If that is you right now, I'm going to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes, right in your seat. You cry out to God, the posture of your heart. You cry out to God and say, I want to genuinely know you for the first time. And listen, as your eyes are closed today, I want to speak to the believer. If you have fallen into the trap of trying to earn it, of trying to modify your behavior, then I ask today that you would repent of that and that you would breathe in grace afresh today. Come on, if that's you, believer, that you would breathe in grace afresh today. Father, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for your grace. God, let us breathe it in and let us exhale grace today. God, grace for the one that doesn't know you and grace for the one that does, Father, but maybe has slipped into this religious performance thing. We repent, God, if we've made it something else and we return to what grace really is, where grace is found, and that is in Jesus. 
BJ, will you lead us this morning? me as we close and we're going to go into our offering time but I need you to hear this today this is for somebody when you come to Christ listen come in close when you come into Christ you are now accepted by the father and what the enemy will try to get you to do is to slip back into performance to earn that acceptance you understand that's why I said stop trying to live out of off of performance and out of performance and learn to live out of being accepted because of what he's already done. You see? That's for someone today. I want you to hear that today as we close. That grace says I can't, but God can. Isn't that good? That God can. Thank you, BJ, for leading us. It's amazing grace. It's, it's a grace that we'll never really comprehend. It's a scandalous grace. So as we close today, we're we're gonna we got two things. We're gonna do our time of offering, but we're also gonna be praying for a young girl who is going to surgery tomorrow. Uh, Corey, do you want to bring Kinsley in here? Is that okay? Okay. So for those that don't know, Corey Smith's daughter. Corey's our nursery director and helps us with kids celebrate. Her daughter's having a pretty serious surgery tomorrow, and I asked her if we could just lay hands on her or reach our hands out to her and pray over her. We're a church that believes that Jesus can do all kinds of cool things. And one of those is healing, right? So, Corey, we just take like one minute and we're timing you. So, one minute. Uh, I'm just teasing. We're not really. But will you just explain kind of what she's going through real quickly? Just take take a second. Um, Kinsley has a bladder that never stopped working. Her bladder, they call it contraction, spasms, contraction. Um, every time she's to go to the bathroom, it's equivalent to a lady going in labor. That's what she feels every time she has to go to the restroom. So, and her kidneys come back up. When it goes down, it shoots them back up. So, we've had one fake surgery that didn't work. They put a machine in last year, and it, it goes into her back, and it connects her spinal cord. It's where it's called, it's called the inner spine. And it was very, very thing is, simply is the youngest and the smallest child to ever have it done, which was last year, he told us the youngest and smallest ever done. It was very successful, but because she is active and she's small, she didn't have enough fat to cover it up, she's broken all the leaks. So they go back in tomorrow, they'll take the machine out of the right side, put a new one in on the left side. Again, connecting to the spinal cords and all of that stuff. And it's kind of, I guess, the fear right now. We know this works, so we know we've got to do it again. But it's still fearful knowing they're going in and playing with their child's spinal cord. And they could hit one wrong thing and it's over. So, you know, even as a mama, I trust the doctor, I trust the nurse, I trust the great physician. And I know who stands to in, but it's still that mama side that, you know, scares you to death. But we do know this is a surgeon successful. 
so we know we don't really have a choice. We've got to go back and do it again. If not, she will live in pain forevermore with the wife. So it's kind of what we go to Vanderbilt to the hospital. We leave, we fly up in the morning, we'll fly back to Tuesday. Well, do you mind both of you just standing here in the middle? Is that cool? I'm going to ask some of our ladies from our church, do you mind coming helping and just maybe laying hands on her? If you believe in this, great. You can reach your hand out towards the family. If not, right? I'm just going to pray over us, get some of our ladies just to help us this morning. If you want to reach your hands out to her right where you're at this morning, that's fine. All right, Father, we just love you in the name of Jesus, and we pray for Jeff and Corey and Kinsley, God. Here's first of all what we pray for, that you would get the glory in it all. Secondly, Father, we pray that you would calm the hearts of the mom and the dad. God, this is, as a, as a father myself, I know it can be a very overwhelming thing. So, Father, I just pray for peace today. Peace, God, that they would just find comfort in your peace. Second, thirdly, God, we pray for the physicians, God, that will be working on Kinsley tomorrow, that you would guide their hands, God, and that you would show your grace through this whole situation, God, that you would show your sovereign power, God, through the hands and through the eyes and through the actions of the physicians, God. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit, you would be with them when they leave today in the airplane, in the car, God, at the hotel, in the, in the hospital room, in the, in the surgery room, that Holy Spirit, that you would be prevalent and present. So, Father, we just ask today, God, that you would comfort, you would guide, and that you would bring rest. In Jesus' name. Will you say amen with me today? Amen. Amen. We believe it. All right. Well, guys, as we as we close today, as we close today, um, we do our offering a little bit differently. If you've been if you're visiting with us today, we like to go out celebrating. We like to start celebrating, and then we like to go out celebrating. So we 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 celebrate Jesus in three ways. Number one is through the worship of song, which which BJ's doing and has done, and through the worship of teaching His Word, but also through our gener generous and sacrificial giving. So we have two brown boxes in our cafe area. This is mainly for those that are a part of our faith family. Uh, they're putting a graphic on the screen that just says we've made it really simple and easy for way uh, to give this morning. Um, if you're like me and don't carry a lot of cash, I like to carry my debit card. You can do that through your smartphone or through online and do that. And here's what I promise you. I promise you that it will all go to reach more people to advance the kingdom of God. So I'm going to pray for us. This is mainly, like I said, for our faith family. If you're a guest today, don't feel obligated to give. But let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for your time today. We thank you for meeting us. And God, here's what I pray, that as we sow into your kingdom today, that you would use it in such a way that you'd get all the credit and glory for it. Use it to reach people. Use it to help people. Use it to serve and minister to people. We thank you for your grace today. We thank you, God, that it's even your grace that we even have money to give. Remind us today that we're not owners, that we're stewards of what you've given us for your glory and your glory. Alone. Amen. Please put your white cards in there for your guests with us on your way out as well. God bless you guys.